Hi, I'm Jason McGee, and I've been working on applying neural networks and deep learning, specifically to tabular data, pretty much nonstop for the last eight months, and I'd like to share what I've found to be important to success. Neural networks and deep learning are pretty popular topics right now, but the research papers, libraries, and applications I see around are generally related to attempting to push the envelope on performance for problems related to images, audio, video, or natural language, but there are so many datasets that are just numbers and categories, and maybe snippets of text. Based on the disparity in coverage on the topic, it might come as a surprise that neural networks can actually perform well on tabular datasets. Now, there are probably some Kagglers out there saying, yeah, but we have boosted trees for that kind of data. And yeah, boosted trees can often perform really well on tabular datasets, but they're not always the best tool for the job. Sometimes, neural networks are. And if nothing else, an appropriately designed and trained neural network can really help to diversify an ensemble of models, which often leads to improved performance. So how does one appropriately design and train neural networks for tabular data? Well, I've put together a list of key steps that I've found to work well, and it all starts with proper data preparation, followed by design, training, and assessment, and only then tuning our network. If we want to build a deep network, we shouldn't just try training some random deep architecture. We need to intentionally choose key aspects of our network and only then, if necessary, build up and out. Let's get started. So we're talking about datasets that may have discrete and continuous variables. If we have missing values in a text or categorical column, we can just increase the cardinality by one or make a new category to represent a missing value. Numerics are a little trickier, but not by much. Our approach is, for each column, impute missing values by taking the median and adding a new column representing whether we impute it or not. So you might be thinking, hold on, so if we had a data set of numeric columns and each had a single missing value, we double the width of the data set? And yes, that is the approach. In some cases, it very well may be a better approach to simply drop the missing values or only impute them rather than adding additional columns. But something to note is that if performance is the main concern, if you're working with categoricals, especially those with high cardinality, the number of columns will likely dwarf the extra imputed value marker columns. Fortunately, we can represent our data with compressed sparse matrices. If the concern is more along the lines of the curse of dimensionality, neural networks actually seem to be able to perform well on very wide datasets. Now that we've fixed our missing values problem, we can move on to transforming our inputs to play nicely with neural networks. There are a number of ways to deal with categorical variables, like encoding based on frequency, encoding ordinally, making an embedding, and encoding based on the correlation of the target, and one-hot encoding. Personally, I've found one-hot encoding to be a reliable way to get strong, consistent performance. There are a number of ways to deal with text. Some really strong approaches include encoding with universal sentence encoder, featureizing with a pre-trained model like BERT, performing TF-IDF, and stacking on a specialized text model. Surprisingly, Unigram TF-IDF often performs quite well and reliably, in addition to outputting a sparse matrix. We generally don't need to do any special transformations to numerics, but normalizing all inputs to be evenly distributed with a negative 1 to 1 or 0 to 1 helps keep gradients more uniform and helps to aid in convergence and reliability across datasets. Visually, we can see the effect of normalizing our inputs such that they are more evenly distributed between bounds instead of however the dataset started. When discussing how to find success in designing and training a neural network, it's important to understand how the decision is made to choose one hyperparameter over another, or choose when to use batch norm or dropout or both. We don't just open a Jupyter notebook and run head on the data frame and glean, oh yep, we're going to need batch norm and a learning rate of 1 neg 3 No, we need to train a model. We need to remove a random subset of the data before training and use it to validate our findings. And that subset, it matters which rows are in it. Random is all well and good until we randomly pick a biased validation set and all hyperparameters we chose are overfit to a biased sample. So instead, we use a combination of holdout and cross-validation to ensure we can design and train the best model we can and, come deployment time, know which model performed best on the subset that none of our models or we had seen before. So we shuffle our data, remove some percentage of the data to use as our holdout, I tend to use 20%, and then fold our data into some k number of parts. I often use five. 
Now we can treat one fold as a validation set as we train a model on the other k minus one folds and get a loss or metric score. We do this on each of the k possible data sets and average our losses or scores to get a non-biased result of how our model performed on the data set. Now that we have confidence in the feedback we receive when training our model, we can move forward. And we're so close to being able to actually build our model, but there's an important step to kick off before we do. We need to establish a benchmark. We need to understand what kinds of models tend to perform well on data and what kind of scores they get on our metric. One approach would be to just run a bunch of models, maybe make an ensemble using the data we prepared for a neural network. But performing specific pre-processing that tends to help certain models or doing any planned feature engineering now will define a strong benchmark to compare our network to. Using grid search or other hyperparameter optimization approaches will also strengthen this benchmark. Once we have this, we'll have a much better idea of how well our neural network is performing, a better understanding of fit, more on this in the assessment section, and some candidates for ensembling. All right, let's get started with network design. A major part of building an appropriate neural network for a specific data set and problem is tuning various hyperparameters. This is going to be a lot more difficult if the network is unstable or has trouble converging. A great way to combat this is to start with a low capacity network. So instead of jumping right into attempting to train a deep and wide model, start small. Maybe try a single layer with 64 units. Starting with this structure makes it easier to get a network to provide a reasonable baseline that we can build from. The key here is stability, so to that end, adding a skip connection from input to output tends to help with this, in addition to helping find linear relationships between features. An important thing to keep in mind is that unlike residual connections in convolutional networks, our layer shapes will likely not line up. But to solve this, we can represent a skip connection with a fully connected layer. It should have the same size as the sync layer and use a linear activation function. We don't want to apply a non-linearity or squash the output as that defeats a purpose. At this point, we can take the sum of all inputs to the output layer and pass it through an output activation. And what should that output activation be? Fortunately, there are some reliable ways to determine the output activation and loss function. So let's get classification out of the way as it's pretty straightforward. Generally speaking, for binary classification, we'll want to use binary cross entropy as our loss function and sigmoid as our output activation. That is, solving for the probability that our prediction should be positive. For mutually exclusive multi-class problems, we'll generally want to use a sparse categorical cross entropy as our loss function and softmax as our output activation. As we're solving for the probability that each class is positive and all probabilities must add up to one. For independent multi-class and multi-label problems, we'll want to use binary or categorical cross entropy as our loss function and sigmoid as our output activation. As we're finding the independent probability that each class prediction should be positive. These are by no means set in stone, but using cross-entropy is useful as it punishes our model not just for being wrong, but depending on how far the probability is from the ground truth. There are alternatives like hinge losses, focal loss, and more which can definitely be considered. As an extra note, using different loss functions from members of an ensemble can be useful to improving performance. So regression. To choose our output activation and loss function, we need to look at the data. Specifically, our targets. By sorting and binning all target values, we can choose the output activation and loss function according to the target distribution. RMSE, room mean squared error, is a great fallback, so when in doubt, we should use RMSE, but look out for exponential and inflated distributions. If our target is zero inflated, we'll want to use Tweety. If our target looks like a Poisson distribution, we should probably use Poisson. If it's an exponential distribution, RMSLE and Gamma are good bets. Google actually released the paper, a general and adaptive robust loss function, which attempts to determine this all automatically and learn the appropriate loss function during training, which is really cool. I love this idea, and I think that this is the direction we should be moving towards. On to the output activation. It's a bit simpler. If it's an exponential distribution, or we have targets of different orders of magnitude, we should use an exponential output activation. Otherwise, use a linear activation. The main idea here is to encourage convergence by mitigating disappearing or exploding gradients, and just generally keeping gradients more uniform in magnitude. Similar motivation as to why we normalized all of our inputs. All right, so we have our output activation and loss function. What about our hidden activation? We have a number of choices. Sigmoid, soft plus, 
Tanch, Swish, Mish. There are so many. ReLU is pretty popular right now, and usually what I see in people's projects and on forums, ReLU, that is rectified linear unit, is just if the input to our activation function is less than zero, set it to zero, otherwise return the input. Leaky ReLU, which is just multiply negative values according to some small positive fraction I specify instead of setting them to zero, can also perform well, but requires hand tuning. Personally, I've found that ReLU and LU, that is parametric ReLU and exponential linear unit, tend to work well. ReLU is similar to leaky ReLU mentioned earlier, but the alpha, which multiplies negative values, is automatically learned by the network. The main idea here is let the network learn the appropriate nonlinearity. LU automatically learns a smooth version of how negative values should be squashed. So we have our baseline network designed. Let's move on to discuss our approach to training. When training our network, the amount of data or percent of our data that we feed into the network each iteration has a major impact on how and what our network learns. If our batch size is too small, it's difficult to converge to minima as our gradients will dramatically change each iteration, and we'll end up jumping all over the place without making meaningful progress. In short, we'll be underfitting. Training will also be very slow. If our batch size is too large, it will tend to converge to sharp minima, which leads to poorer generalization and also requires more ramp. It's clear that a happy medium is needed, a nice balance between small and large batch sizes. After testing many batch sizes across hundreds of datasets, from hundreds of rows to tens of millions of rows with a wide range of widths, an optimal batch size appears to be a function of the total size of the dataset. A good rule of thumb seems to be set the batch size to be 1% of the dataset size. With grid search, we can often find a better one, but when getting the first model going, this is a great place to start. I want to know this is without weight decay, and introducing or increasing weight decay generally aids convergence for larger batch sizes. Now that we have a batch size chosen, we can determine our learning rate. We'll be making use of a very successful learning rate policy called One Cycle, invented by the researcher Leslie Smith. But first, we need to determine the learning rate we'll be using as a basis for it. One approach that provides a good starting point for a learning rate, which once again can often be tuned to get small improvements, is called the LR range test. The idea is, start from a very small learning rate and exponentially increase it to a number larger than one, tracking the loss or a metric score over time. Usually it's done over one epoch or so. Often a bit of smoothing is helpful to interpret results. The idea is, there is usually a consistently decreasing section of the loss in the plot, and a good learning rate will be in this section. This point is often a tenth to a twentieth of the learning rate at the minimum loss. I've seen some different approaches to determining a good learning rate that use binary search to test different learning rates, but the LR range test generally works well. Now that we have our learning rate, we can build our one cycle learning rate policy. The learning rate we chose will be at the maximum learning rate we'll use while training our network. So, the main idea here is, we'll first warm up our network starting from some fraction of our maximum learning rate, usually 1 to 20%. I've heard a number of theories as to why warming up is necessary, but the one that makes most sense to me, at least when using Atom, is that we need to properly initialize both first and second moment estimations, that is, decaying averages of past gradients and past gradients squared. If we use too large of a learning rate, we'll get crazy gradients that aren't representative of the local shape of our cost surface and make us take poor steps, which isn't helpful to convergence. I found that spending about 25% of warming up tends to work well. Once we've finished warming up, we'll decay our learning rate back to the initial learning rate over the next 50% of training. Using a high learning rate allows us to quickly arrive at a general area of our cost surface, which will enable us to converge to a good minima. But if we keep using a high learning rate, we'll overcompensate based on our gradients and fail to converge. Once our learning rate arrives back at our initial learning rate, we can spend the last 25% of training warming down, that is, reducing the learning rate to 1 to 10% of our initial learning rate, which helps to fine tune our weights and descend into good minima. Now, we could vary the learning rate linearly or according to some other function, but we use cosine as it spends more time near the values we're interpolating between and less time on transitioning, which means spending more time at low learning rates warming up, more time at high learning rates when we're training at our max, and more time at the lowest learning rates when we're warming down, which seems to improve convergence. If we're going to build this one cycle learning rate policy, we need to build it with a specific number of epochs, so we need to choose what that number of epochs will be. If we're using a constant learning rate, we'll just pick some arbitrarily large number of epochs and early stop based on a validation score, but this won't work using the one cycle policy, 
When we're choosing how many epics to fit our one cycle policy to, we want to pick enough epics so it doesn't underfit, but not so many that we overfit. To start with only a few epics, and then assess our performance, and should we deem it necessary, make use of a strategy such as binary search to find a better number of epics. If we start with 4, and then try 8 and it does better, try 16 and it does worse, so we try 12, etc. So we've mentioned tuning and assessment a few times now, let's talk about how we'll approach assessing our model's performance. Earlier, we examined our bin target distribution to determine which loss function and output activation our network would be using. Assuming we're working on a regression problem, it turns out another great application for this is to periodically generate and bin predictions on our training data and our validation data, and track them over the course of training. If we compare these bin predictions to our bin targets, we can get a sense of how well we're capturing the distribution, which is a lot more information than an RMSE score, and complements it nicely. Looking at the distribution of our bin targets over time can help to provide us with insights like how quickly aspects of the distribution were captured and if any were forgotten. But we should also track our metric or loss over time for both the training and validation data. We can look at the disparity between the training and validation loss, often referred to as generalization error, which helps to instruct us on how well our model will generalize to out-of-sample data. Not only will we have this information for each cross-validation fold, but we can keep and compare this information whenever we're tuning a hyperparameter, changing how we're pre-processing data, or doing feature engineering or selection. We generate a lot of data during training, so let's leverage it to inform ourselves as deeply as possible and take intuitive steps to improve our network. If we're working with classification data, we can use bin predictions in the form of probabilities and confusion matrices, which we can track over time and between our training and cross-validation folds. This has the added benefit of understanding which classes tend to be confused with one another for the training data folds and each cross-validation fold. The bin probabilities help to explain the model's confidence in class-specific predictions. At this point, we have scores in either confusion matrices or target distributions over time and should have a good sense of fit, but it's relative, so a really valuable next step is comparing these findings with each model in our established benchmark. Which models are beating the neural network is important to consider before tuning. Are they middle of the pack? Worse than linear models? Worse than tree-based models? Worse than XGBoost? Topping the benchmark other than ensembles? Including ensembles? If we get a sense of which models are performing better than our network, it can help to inform what steps we should take. If linear models are beating our network, something is likely seriously wrong. With our skip connection, we should be able to recognize linear relationships. If this is the case, we should remove our hidden layer and consider walking through our design steps again, reconsidering our output activation and loss function. But it is still worth looking at confusion matrices or comparisons in prediction and target distributions. Middle of the pack may be a more reasonable first step. We can probably proceed to tuning. Performing worse than trees specifically may be an indicative of a discontinuity like artificial clipping in the data or multimodal or overlapping distributions. These are things a bit more difficult to deal with for neural networks, but there are definitely things we can do. One option is stacking with a tree model, which means we'll incorporate the predictions of a tree based model into the input feature set of our network. A second option is manually setting boundaries probably by observing splits of a tree-based model and training a separate neural network for each split. A third is training one network, freezing it, running predictions on all data and removing the samples it performed best on from the training data, then repeating this until we fit the data the best we can. Finally, training an ensemble model on the original data set, which takes the output of each frozen network. This might be a tree-based model or a neural network. Intentionally overfitting these subnetworks can often improve performance. The main takeaway here is, consider how other types of models perform on your problem and incorporate what they do well. A single model or model type isn't always the best option. Even if our model tops the benchmark, we can likely still improve it with tuning. So at this point, I've talked about neural network this and neural network that, but not deep learning. Fortunately, some simple first steps in tuning can be related to architecture and increasing the capacity of the network. What happens when we widen the network? Something like 1024 units. What happens when we increase the depth? Maybe two or three layers at 64 units? 
When we make it simple, eight units, from here we can generally form a strong idea of the direction we should be heading. It's important that we rerun the LR range test whenever we change the architecture, batch size, or other hyperparameters, as higher capacity networks can often have more chaotic loss surfaces, which might explain why using smaller learning rates tend to help. If our capacity is larger, we often need to run more iterations, so either epics or a smaller batch size, but smaller batch size means more regularization, which can limit convergence if used in excess. For classification, and especially deeper networks, depending on the problem, introducing batch norm can be a technique which may dramatically improve performance. For regression, especially just before output, batch norm seems to mess with predictions and can be detrimental to performance, so use caution. For a more formulaic approach to tuning, if a generalization error, that is, difference between training and validation loss, or metric score, is low, we may be underfitting. Conversely, if our generalization error is high, we may be overfitting. If we're overfitting, we likely want to start with regularizing. This generally should be in the form of increasing learning rate, decreasing batch size, introducing weight decay, running fewer epics, reducing network capacity, or introducing dropout. If we're underfitting, we likely want to either increase the complexity of our network, reduce regularization, or just run our network for more iterations.